The Big Toe. A boy was digging at the edge of the garden when he saw a big toe. He tried to pick it up, but it was stuck to something. So he gave it a good hard jerk and it came off in his hand. Then he heard something groan and scamper away. The boy took the toe into the kitchen and showed it to his mother. It looks nice and plump, she said. I'll put it in the soup and we'll have it for supper. That night, his father carved the toe into three pieces and they each had a piece. Then they did the dishes and when it got dark, they went to bed. The boy fell asleep almost at once, but in the middle of the night, a sound awakened him. It was something out in the street. It was a voice, and it was calling to him. Where is my toe? It groaned. When the boy heard that, he got very scared, but he thought, it doesn't know where I am. It will never find me. Then he heard the voice once more. Only now it was closer. Where is my toe? It groaned. The boy pulled the blankets over his head and closed his eyes. I'll go to sleep, he thought. When I wake up, it will be gone. But soon he heard the back door open, and again he heard the voice, Where is my toe? It groaned. Then the boy heard footsteps move through the kitchen, into the dining room, into the living room, into the front hall. Then slowly they climbed the stairs, closer and closer they came. Soon they were in the upstairs hall. Now they were outside his door. Where is my toe? The voice groaned. His door opened. Shaking with fear, he listened as the footsteps slowly moved through the dark toward his bed. Then they stopped. Where is my toe? The voice groaned. You've got it! What do you come for? There was an old woman who lived all by herself, and she was very lonely. Sitting in the kitchen one night, she said, Oh, I wish I had some company. No sooner had she spoken than down the chimney tumbled two feet from which the flesh had rotted. The old woman's eyes bulged with terror. Then two legs dropped to the hearth and attached themselves to the feet. Then a body tumbled down. Then two arms and a man's head. The old woman watched. The parts came together into a great gangling man. The man danced around and around the room. Faster and faster he went. Then he stopped and he looked into her eyes. What do you come for? She asked in a small voice that shivered and shook. What do I come for? He said. I come for you! As you shout the last words, stamp your foot and jump at somebody nearby. Me Tai Doty Walker. There was a haunted house where every night a bloody head fell down the chimney. At least that's what people said so nobody would stay there overnight. Then a rich man offered $200 to whoever would do it, and this boy said he would try if he could have his dog with him. So it was all settled. The very next night, the boy went to the house with his dog. 
To make it more cheerful, he started a fire in the fireplace. Then he sat in front of the fire and waited, and his dog waited with him. For a while, nothing happened. But a little after midnight, he heard someone singing softly and sadly off in the woods. The singing sounded something like this. Meet I Dodie Walker. It's just somebody singing, the boy told himself, but he, he was frightened. Then his dog answered the song. Softly and sadly it sang. Linchi, kinchi, kali, mali, dingo, dingo. The boy could not believe his ears. His dog had never uttered a word before. Then a few minutes later he heard the singing again. Now it was closer and louder, but the words were the same. Me tai do di walker. This time the boy tried to stop his dog from answering. He was afraid that whoever was singing would hear it and come after them. But his dog paid no attention, and again it sang, Lynchy, kinchy, kali, mali, dingo, dingo. A half hour later, the boy heard the singing again. Now it was in the backyard, and the song was the same. Me Tai Dodi Walker. Again, the boy tried to keep his dog quiet, but the dog sang louder than ever. Linchy, kinchy, kali, mali, dingo, dingo. Soon the boy heard the singing again. Now it was coming down the chimney. Me Tai Dodi Walker. The dog sang right back. Linchy, kinchy, kali, mali, dingo, dingo. Suddenly, a bloody head fell out of the chimney. It missed the fire and landed right next to the dog. The dog took one look and fell over, dead from fright. The head turned and stared at the boy. Slowly, it opened its mouth and... A man who lived in Leeds. Some say this rhyme doesn't mean anything. Others are not so sure. There was a man who lived in Leeds. He filled his garden full of seeds. And when the seeds began to grow, it was like a garden filled with snow. But when the snow began to melt, it was like a ship without a belt. And when the ship began to sail, it was like a bird without a tail. And when the bird began to fly, it was like an eagle in the sky. And when the sky began to roar, it was like a lion at my door. And when the door began to crack, it was like a penknife in my back. And when my back began to bleed, I was dead, dead, dead indeed. <laughs> Old woman, all skin and bone. There was an old woman, all skin and bone, who lived near the graveyard all alone. Ooh, ooh, ooh. She thought she'd go to church one day to hear the parson preach and pray. Ooh, ooh, ooh. And when she came to the church house stile, she thought she'd stop and rest a while. Ooh. When she came up to the door, she thought she'd stop and rest some more. Ooh. But when she turned and looked around she saw a corpse upon the ground Ooh. from
From its nose down to its chin, the worms crawled out and the worms crawled in. The woman to the preacher said, Shall I look like that when I am dead? The preacher to the woman said, You'll look like that when you are dead. <laughs> Cold as clay. A farmer had a daughter for whom he cared more than anything on earth. She fell in love with a farmhand named Jim, but the farmer did not think Jim was good enough for his daughter. To keep them apart, he sent her to live with her uncle on the other side of the county. Soon after she left, Jim got sick, and he wasted away and died. Everyone said he died of a broken heart. The farmer felt so guilty about Jim's death, he could not tell his daughter what had happened. She continued to think about Jim and the life they might have had together. One night, many weeks later, there was a knock on her uncle's door. When the girl opened the door, Jim was standing there. Your father asked me to get you, he said. I came on his best horse. Is there anything wrong, she asked. I don't know, he said. She packed a few things and they left. She rode behind him, clinging to his waist. Soon he complained of a headache. It aches something terrible, he told her. She put her hand on his forehead. Why, you're as cold as clay, she said. I hope you're not ill. And she wrapped her handkerchief around his head. They traveled so swiftly that in a few hours they reached the farm. The girl quickly dismounted and knocked on the door. Her father was startled to see her. Didn't you send for me, she asked. No, I didn't, he said. She turned to Jim, but he was gone. And so was the horse. They went to the stable to look for them. The horse was there. It was covered with sweat and trembling with fear. But there was no sign of Jim. Terrified, her father told her the truth about Jim's death. Then quickly he went to see Jim's parents. They decided to open his grave. The corpse was in its coffin, but around its head they found the girl's handkerchief. The Hearse Song. Don't you ever laugh as the hearse goes by, for you may be the next to die. They wrap you up in a big white sheet, from your head down to your feet. They put you in a big black box and cover you up with dirt and rocks. All goes well for about a week. Then your coffin begins to leak. The worms crawl in, the worms crawl out. The worms play pinochle on your snout. They eat your eyes, they eat your nose. They eat the jelly between your toes. A big green worm with rolling eyes crawls in your stomach and out your eyes. Your stomach turns a slimy green and pus pours out like whipping cream. You spread it on a slice of bread and that's what you eat when you are dead. <laughs> A new horse. Two farmhands shared a room. One slept at the back of the room, the other slept near the door. After a while, the one who slept near the door began to feel very tired early in the day. His friend asked what was wrong, 
An awful thing happens every night, he said. A witch turns me into a horse and rides me all over the countryside. Well, I'll sleep in your bed tonight, his friend said. We'll see what happens to me. About midnight, an old woman who lived nearby came into the room. She mumbled some strange words over the farmhand, and he found he couldn't move. Then she slipped a bridle on him, and he turned into a horse. Next thing he knew, she was riding him across the fields at breakneck speed, beating him to make him go even faster. Soon they came to a house where a party was going on. There was a lot of music and dancing. They were having a big time inside. She hitched him to a fence and went in. While she was gone, the farmhand rubbed against the fence until the bridle came off, and he turned back into a human being. Then he went into the house and found the witch. He spoke those strange words over her, and with the bridle, he turned her into a horse. Then he rode her to a blacksmith and had her fitted with horseshoes. After that, he rode her to the farm where she lived. I have a pretty good filly here, he told her husband, but I need a stronger horse. Would you like to trade? The old man looked her over, and he said he would do it. So they picked out another horse, and the farmhand rode away. Her husband led his new horse to the barn. He took off the bridle and went to hang it up. But when he came back, the new horse was gone. Instead, there stood his wife with horseshoes nailed to her hands and feet. Alligators. A young woman in town married a man from another part of the country. He was a nice fellow, and they got along pretty well together. There was only one problem. Every night, he'd go swimming in the river. Sometimes he would be gone all night long, and she would complain about how lonely she was. This couple had two young sons. As soon as the boys could walk their father began to teach them how to swim. And when they got to be old enough, he took them swimming in the river at night. Often they would stay there all night long, and the young woman would stay home all by herself. After a while, she began to act in a strange way. At least, that's what the neighbors said. She told them that her husband was turning into an alligator and that he was trying to turn the boys into alligators. Everybody told her there was nothing wrong with a man taking his son swimming. That was a natural thing to do. And when it came to alligators, well, there just weren't any nearby. Everybody knew that. Early one morning, the young woman came running into town from the direction of the river. She was soaking wet. She said a big alligator and two little alligators had pulled her in and had tried to get her to eat raw fish. They were her husband and her sons, she said, and they wanted her to live with them, but she had gotten away. Her doctor decided she had lost her mind, and he had her put in the hospital for a while. After that, nobody saw her husband and boys again. They just disappeared. But now and then, a fisherman would tell about seeing alligators in the river at night. Usually, it was one big alligator and two small ones. But people said they were just making it up. Everybody knows there aren't any alligators around here. Room for one more. A man named Joseph Blackwell came to Philadelphia on a business trip. He stayed with friends in the big house they owned outside the city. 
That night, they had a good time visiting, but when Blackwell went to bed, he tossed and turned and couldn't sleep. Sometime during the night, he heard a car turn into the driveway. He went to the window to see who was arriving at such a late hour. In the moonlight, he saw a long black hearse filled with people. The driver of the hearse looked up at him. When Blackwell saw his queer, hideous face, he shuddered. The driver called to him, There is room for one more. Then he waited a minute or two, and then he drove off. In the morning, Blackwell told his friends what had happened. You were dreaming, they said. I must have been, he said, but it didn't seem like a dream. After breakfast, he went into Philadelphia. He spent the day high above the city in one of the new office buildings there. Late in the afternoon, he was waiting for an elevator to take him back down to the street. But when it arrived, it was very crowded. One of the passengers looked out and called to him. There is room for one more, he said. It was the driver of the hearse. Uh, no thanks, said Blackwell. I'll get the next one. The doors closed and the elevator started down. There was shrieking and screaming, then the sound of a crash. The elevator had fallen to the bottom of the shaft. Everyone aboard was killed. The Dead Man's Brains This scary story is a scary game that people play at Halloween, but it can be played whenever the spirit moves you. The players sit in a circle in a darkened room and listen to a storyteller describe the rotting remains of a corpse. Each part is passed around for them to feel. In one version, a player is out if he or she screams or gasps with fright. In another version, everybody stays to the end no matter how scared they get. Here's the story. Once in this town, there lived a man named Brown. It was years ago on this night that he was murdered out of spite. We have here his remains. First, let's feel his brains, which is a wet, squishy tomato. Now here are his eyes, still frozen with surprise. Two peeled grapes. This is his nose, a chicken bone. Here is his ear, a dried apricot. And here is his hand, rotting flesh and bone. A cloth or rubber glove filled with mud or ice. But his hair still grows. A handful of corn silk or wet fur or yarn. And his heart still beats now and then a piece of raw liver. And his blood still flows. Dip your fingers in it. It's nice and warm. A bowl of ketchup thinned with warm water. That's all there is, except for these worms. They are the ones that ate the rest of him. <laughs> a handful of wet cooked spaghetti noodles. The Hook Donald and Sarah went to the movies. Then they went for a ride in Donald's car. They parked up on a hill at the edge of town. From there they could see the lights up and down the valley. Donald turned on the radio and found some music. But an announcer broke in with a news bulletin. A murderer has escaped from the state prison. He is armed with a knife and is headed south on foot. His left hand is missing. In its place, he wears a hook. Well, let's roll up the windows and lock the doors, said Sarah. That's a good idea, said Donald. That prison isn't too far away, said Sarah. Maybe we really should go home. 
But it's only 10 o'clock, said Donald. I don't care what time it is, she said. I want to go home. Look, Sarah, said Donald, he's not going to climb all the way up here. Why would he do that? Even if he did, all the doors are locked. How could he get in? Donald, he could take that hook and break through a window and open a door, she said. I'm scared and I want to go home. Donald was annoyed. Girls always are afraid of something, he said. As he started the car, Sarah thought she heard someone or something scratching at her door. Did you hear that? she asked as they roared away. It sounded like somebody was trying to get in. Oh, sure, said Donald. Soon they got to her house. Would you like to come in and have some cocoa, she asked. No, he said. I've got to go home. He went around to the other side of the car to let her out. Hanging on the door handle was a hook. High Beams the girl driving the old blue sedan was a senior at the high school. She lived on a farm about eight miles away and used the car to drive back and forth. She had driven into town that night to see a basketball game. Now she was on her way home. As she pulled away from the school, she noticed a red pickup truck follow her out of the parking lot. A few minutes later, the truck was still behind her. Hmm, I guess we're going in the same direction, she thought. She began to watch the truck in her mirror. When she changed her speed, the driver in the truck changed his speed. When she passed the car, so did he. Then he turned on his high beams, flooding her car with light. He left them on for almost a minute. He probably wants to pass me, she thought, but she was becoming uneasy. Usually, she drove home over a back road. Not too many people went that way. But when she turned onto that road, so did the truck. I've got to get away from him, she thought. And she began to drive faster. Then he turned his high beams on again. After a minute, he turned them off. Then he turned them on again and off again. She drove even faster, but the truck driver stayed right behind her. Then he turned his high beams on again. Once more, her car was ablaze with light. What is he doing, she wondered. What does he want? Then he turned them off again. But a minute later, he had them on again, and he left them on. At last, she pulled into her driveway, and the truck pulled in right behind her. She jumped from the car and ran to the house. Call the police, she screamed at her father. Out in the driveway, she could see the driver of the truck. He had a gun in his hand. When the police arrived, they started to arrest him, but he pointed to the girl's car. You don't want me, he said. You want him. Crouched behind the driver's seat, there was a man with a knife. As the driver of the truck explained it, the man slipped into the girl's car just before she left the school. He saw it happen, but there was no way he could stop it. He thought about getting the police, but he was afraid to leave her. So he followed her car. Each time the man in the back seat reached up to overpower her, the driver of the truck turned on his high beams. Then the man dropped down, afraid that someone might see him. The Babysitter It was nine o'clock in the evening. Everybody was sitting on the couch in front of the TV. There were Richard... Brian, Jenny, and Doreen, the babysitter. The telephone rang. Maybe it's your mother, said Doreen. She picked up the phone. Before she could say a word, a man laughed hysterically and hung up. Who was it, asked Richard. Some nut, said Doreen. What did I miss? At 9.30, the telephone rang again. Doreen answered it. It was the man who had called before. I'll be there soon, he said, <laughs> and he laughed and hung up. Who was it, the children asked. Some crazy person, she said. 
About ten o'clock, the telephone rang again. Jenny got to it first. Hello, she said. It was the same man. One more hour, he said. <laughs> and he laughed and hung up. He said one more hour. What did he mean? asked Jenny. Don't worry, said Doreen. It's somebody fooling around. I'm scared, said Jenny. About 10.30, the telephone rang once more. When Doreen picked it up, the man said, Pretty soon now. <laughs> Why are you doing this? Doreen screamed, and he hung up. Was, was it that guy again? asked Brian. Yes, said Doreen. I'm going to call the operator and complain. The operator told her to call back if it happened again, and she would try to trace the call. At 11 o'clock, the telephone rang again. Doreen answered it. Very soon now, the man said. <laughs> and he hung up. Doreen called the operator. Almost at once, she called back. That person is calling from a telephone upstairs, she said. You'd better leave. I'll get the police. Just then, a door upstairs opened. A man they had never seen before started down the stairs toward them. As they ran from the house, he was smiling in a very strange way. A few minutes later, the police found him there and arrested him. The Viper A widow lived alone on the top floor of an apartment house. One morning, her telephone rang. Hello, she said. This is the Viper, a man said. I'm coming up. Somebody's fooling around, she thought, and hung up. A half hour later, the telephone rang again. It was the same man. It's the Viper, he said. I'll be up soon. The widow didn't know what to think, but she was getting frightened. Once more, the telephone rang. Again, it was the viper. I'm coming up now, he said. She quickly called the police. They said they would be right over. When the doorbell rang, she sighed with relief. Oh, they're here, she thought. But when she opened the door, there stood a little old man with a bucket and a cloth. I'm the viper, he said. I wish to wash and wipe. The windows. The Slithery D. The Slithery D. He came out of the sea. He ate all the others, but he didn't eat me. The Slithery D. He came out of the sea. He ate all the others, but he didn't eat. Aaron Kelly's Bones Aaron Kelly was dead. They bought him a coffin and had a funeral and buried him. But that night, he got out of his coffin, and he came home. His family was sitting around the fire when he walked in. He sat down next to his widow, and he said, What's going on? You all act like somebody died. Who's dead? His widow said, You are. I don't feel dead, he said. I feel fine. You don't look fine, his widow said. You look dead. You'd better get back to the grave where you belong. I'm not going back to the grave until I feel dead, he said. Since Aaron wouldn't go back, his widow couldn't collect his life insurance. Without that, she couldn't pay for the coffin. And the undertaker said he would take it back. Aaron didn't care. He just sat by the fire, rocking in a chair and warming his hands and feet. But his joints were dry. <laughs> <laughs>
and his back was stiff, and every time he moved, he creaked and cracked. One night, the best fiddler in town came to court the widow. Since Aaron was dead, the fiddler wanted to marry her. The two of them sat on one side of the fire, and Aaron sat on the other, creaking and cracking. How long do we have to put up with this dead corpse? the widow asked. Something must be done, the fiddler said. This isn't very jolly, Aaron said. Let's dance. The fiddler got out his fiddle and began to play. Aaron stretched himself, shook himself, got up, took a step or two, and began to dance. With his old bones rattling and his yellow teeth snapping and his bald head wagging and his arms flip-flopping, around and around he went with his long legs clicking and his knee bones knocking. He skipped and pranced around the room. How that dead man danced! But pretty soon, a bone worked loose and fell to the floor. Look at that, said the fiddler. Play faster, said the widow. The fiddler played faster. Crickety-crack, down and back, the dead man went hopping, and his dry bones kept dropping. This way, that way, the pieces just kept popping. Play, man, play, cried the widow. Old bones rattling, yellow teeth snapping, bald head wagging, arms flip-flopping, long legs clicking, knee bones knocking, skipping, prancing, round the room, round and round and round the room, crickety crack, down and back, bones hopping, bones dropping, pieces popping, round the room, round and round and round the room. The fiddler fiddled, and dead Aaron danced. Then Aaron fell apart, collapsed into a pile of bones, all except his bald head bone. That grinned at the fiddler, cracked its teeth, and kept dancing. Look at that, groaned the fiddler. Play louder, cried the widow. Ho-ho-ho-ho, said the head bone. Ain't we having fun? The fiddler couldn't stand it. Widow, he said, I'm going home and he never came back. The family gathered up Aaron's bones and put them back in the coffin. They mixed them up so he couldn't fit them together. After that, Aaron stayed in his grave, but his widow never did get married again. Aaron had seen to that. Wait till Martin comes. An old man was out for a walk. When a storm came up, he looked for a place to take shelter. Soon he came to an old house. He ran up on the porch and knocked on the door, but nobody answered. By now, rain was pouring down. Thunder was booming and lightning was flashing. So he tried the door. When he found it was unlocked, he went inside. Except for a pile of wooden boxes, the house was empty. He broke up some of the boxes and made a fire with them. Then he sat down in front of the fire and dried himself. It was so warm and cozy that he fell asleep. When he woke up, a black cat was sitting near the fire. It stared at him for a while. Then it purred. That's a nice cat, he thought, and he dozed off again. When he opened his eyes, there was a second cat in the room. But this one was as big as a wolf. It looked at him very closely, and it asked, <sighs> Shall we, we do, do it, it now? No, no said, said the, the other, other cat. cat. Let's, Let's wait till, till Martin comes. comes. I'm, I'm, I must be dreaming, thought the old man. He closed his eyes again. Then he took another look. But now there was a third cat in the room, and this cat was as big as a tiger. 
It looked the old man over, and it asked, <laughs> Shall we do it now? No, said the others. Let's wait till Martin comes. The old man jumped up, jumped out the window, and started running. And he yelled over his shoulder, When Martin comes, you tell him I couldn't wait. But somebody nearby... Me Tai Doty Walker. There was a haunted house where every night a bloody head fell down the chimney. At least that's what people said, so nobody would stay there overnight. Then a rich man offered $200 to whoever would do it, and this boy said he would try if he could have his dog with him. So it was all settled. The very next night, the boy went to the house with his dog. To make it more cheerful, he started a fire in the fireplace. Then he sat in front of the fire and waited, and his dog waited with him. For a while, nothing happened. But a little after midnight, he heard someone singing softly and sadly off in the woods. The singing sounded something like this. Me Tai Doty Walker. It's just somebody singing, the boy told himself, but he, he was frightened. Then his dog answered the song. Softly and sadly it sang. Ling Chi King Chi Kali. The Big Toe. A boy was digging at the edge of the garden when he saw a big toe. He tried to pick it up, but it was stuck to something. So he gave it a good hard jerk, and it came off in his hand. Then he heard something groan and scamper away. The boy took the toe into the kitchen and showed it to his mother. It looks nice and plump, she said. I'll put it in the soup, and we'll have it for supper. That night, his father carved the toe into three pieces, and they each had a piece. Then they did the dishes, and when it got dark, they went to bed. The boy fell asleep almost at once, but in the middle of the night, a sound awakened him. It was something out in the street. It was a voice, and it was calling to him. Where is my toe? It groaned. When the boy heard that, he got very scared. But he thought, it doesn't know where I am. It will never find me. Then he heard the voice once more. Only now it was closer. Where it? What do you come for? There was an old woman who lived all by herself, and she was very lonely. Sitting in the kitchen one night, she said, Oh, I wish I had some company. No sooner had she spoken than down the chimney tumbled two feet from which the flesh had rotted. The old woman's eyes bulged with terror. Then two legs dropped to the hearth, and attach themselves to the feet. Then a body tumbled down, then two arms, and a man's head. As the old woman watched, the parts came together into a great gangling man. The man danced around and around the room. Faster and faster he went, then he stopped, and he looked into her eyes. What do you come for? She asked in a small voice that shivered and shook. What do I come for? He said. I come for you! As you shout the last words, stamp your foot and jump. Is my toe? It groaned. 
The boy pulled the blankets over his head and closed his eyes. I'll go to sleep, he thought. When I wake up, it will be gone. But soon he heard the back door open, and again he heard the voice. Where is my toe? It groaned. Then the boy heard footsteps move through the kitchen, into the dining room, into the living room, into the front hall. Then slowly they climbed the stairs. Closer and closer they came. Soon they were in the upstairs hall. Now they were outside his door. Where is my toe? The voice groaned. His door opened. Shaking with fear, he listened as the footsteps slowly moved through the dark toward his bed. Then they stopped. Where is my toe? The voice groaned. You've got him! The boy could not believe his ears. His dog had never uttered a word before. Then a few minutes later, he heard the singing again. Now it was closer and louder, but the words were the same. Me tai do di walker. This time the boy tried to stop his dog from answering. He was afraid that whoever was singing would hear it and come after them. But his dog paid no attention, and again it sang, Lynchy, kinchy, kali, molly, dingo, dingo. A half hour later, the boy heard the singing again. Now it was in the backyard, and the song was the same. Me, Tai, Dodi, Walker. Again, the boy tried to keep his dog quiet. But the dog sang louder than ever. Lynchy, kinchy, kali, molly, dingo, dingo. Soon the boy heard the singing again. Now it was coming down the chimney. Me, Tai, Dodi, Walker. The dog sang right back. Lynchy, kinchy, kali.